Learning the language and logic of the research process in the social sciences is like learning a new language. It's difficult, but will result in the acquisition of an invaluable set of skills for both your degree work and your later professional career. In social sciences, we typically divide research into two broad categories, qualitative and quantitative. Inductive research is qualitative research. Here, as we saw with the Strauss article, we typically translate concrete observations into concepts, categories, and then generalizing theories. Quantitative research or deductive research typically is referred to as the logical deductive model or, or even simply the scientific method. Here, we translate categories and concepts into abstract general theories and then with clear definitions. So the conceptualization process means specifying exactly what we mean by a term and the operationalization process now connects concepts to observations that can be measured. Research hypotheses sits in the background and allows us during the process to create variables that can be used to test our theories and our hypotheses. <coughs> Remembering now from the Strauss article and grounded theory, even though we are now conceptualizing going forward with a logical deductive model and quantitative research, we can also at the same time look backward as we think through how categories and concepts come into being. So a category would be deviance, its definition, the violation of normative aspects of social life. A concept, and remember that concepts initially are derived from behavioral observations, might be like traffic violations. And operational indicators or variables, that which can be measured, might be running a red light. So the operationalization of concepts is a process whereby concepts become variables or aspects that vary and aspects that can be measured. Measurement here is the key word. Indicators or values are concrete measurements. So for example, indicators or values of traffic violations would be full stop and looks both ways, stops, slows down, and runs to the stop sign. The language of variables and of hypotheses can be the most perplexing and confusing to people new at learning the language. This is far more difficult in sociological survey data than, for example, in psychological experimental data. The independent variable is the cause or predictor variable. The dependent variable is the outcome variable. There are other variables such as control moderator or extraneous variables. The latter, the extraneous variable, will be connected to spurious relationships later in this lecture. So a hypothesis, most clearly, is in this model, a statement about the relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable. Typically, we think of a hypothesis as an educated guess in the most general sense of the term. Here, there is, again, to review or re-emphasize a difference among social and behavioral sciences. Psychologists typically rely more on the experiment. Sociologists are far more likely to use survey data. In an experiment, the independent variable is much easier to identify. A research hypothesis, nonetheless, is a definitive statement of the relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable. There are a number of different ways of designing a research project. Qualitative research projects 
are like ethnography, using the inductive method. Here, we're focused more on quantitative or logical deductive models for research design. The experimental design is key among those. The quasi-experimental design, again, is slightly different, has much more traction in sociology than the experimental design for a number of reasons having to do with what kinds of problems can be addressed with the two types of designs. Again, sociologists are quite likely or much more likely to use surveys or which result in descriptive or correlational studies, often causal modeling using advanced statistical procedures. In this introduction to research course, we will use only descriptive, or we will create only descriptive data. True experiments are designs in which an experimental group receives a treatment and a control group does not. Assuming that there are no other differences or all other things are equal, the resulting differences between the two groups after the experiment can be attributed to the experimental conditions. And typically, researchers who use the experimental design take great caution in ensuring that there are no systematic differences in the individuals assigned to the two groups to ensure that it is indeed the experimental condition that results in a change among the two groups. A quasi-experimental design attempts to replicate this process in more naturally occurring conditions. So, for example, if we are interested in assessing the uh, value of a program for the homeless, we might randomly assign people to shelters or to two different types of shelters, one with the program, one simply a shelter, and then assess differences between the two groups at the end of six months. In the quasi-experimental design now, we would attribute or suggest or corroborate, if we find differences, our hypothesis that the program is the cause of the differences between the two groups. You can see, I hope, that a quasi-experiment, while to a certain extent replicating the design of the experiment, has far less control over the, in quotes, experimental conditions than a true experiment. Many other things can intercede or affect outcomes of individuals in the two groups, and especially over a period of six months. Correlations have a very specific term in research methods. Correlations are a specific data analysis procedure in which we plot individual cases along an X and Y axis and then examine the degree to which a change in X explains a change in Y. A key goal of social science research is to generate causal explanations for phenomena. In sociological research, we typically have two types of causal models. To the left, the nomothetic shows or illustrates a way of organizing a study or organizing data to assess the relationship between neighborhood income and crime rates. So here we would see that high income neighborhoods would have lower crime rates. This contrasts with the ideographic method, which is used for individual cases or specific uh, 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 individuals or specific groups. Here we trace the causal mechanisms in a process that results in an outcome that we observe. Especially in survey research, because we cannot rely on an experimental design to identify the independent variables, it becomes important that we establish strict rules for the assignment of causality. There must be an empirical association, 
there must be an appropriate time order, that is, an independent variable must precede the dependent variable, the relationship cannot be uh, spurious, it's good if we can identify the causal mechanisms at work, and we need to specify the context in which the relationship, the causal relationship holds. So empirical association, again, in a true experiment, the results are a result of the experimental condition. Here we're looking at sleep deprivation and reaction time, and because of the nature of the design, that is the experimental design, we can conclude that differences in the reaction time at the end of the experiment result from the experimental conditions or sleep deprivation. Survey research is a little trickier. Variables are correlated or associated, so here again we see that the number of hours studying is related to grade point average, and we could assume that there is a causal relationship, but here we have variables that are correlated or associated. The time order, again, in an experimental design or a quasi-experimental design is not problematic because we know that the experimental condition precedes the outcome. In non-experimental designs, such as, you know, typically survey research, this is a little tricky. Generally, we think of uh, a logical time ordering, such as ethnicity or gender, not always quite so transparent, but we know, for example, that ethnicity or gender might contribute to or predict income or status. However, income could never cause gender or uh, ethnicity. A cross-sectional design also helps us in establishing a time order in a ways that are very simply to, similar to the quasi-experimental design, we can look at groups and compare them at one point in time. These are so similar to the quasi-experimental design, again, it can result in a great deal of confusion. So if we look at groups at the same time, at one point in time, and compare them on outcomes, this is what we mean by the cross-sectional design. A longitudinal design looks or examines changes in behavior in one group or one individual at more than one point in time. The relationship cannot be a spurious relationship. So, for example, there is a an association, an observed association, between the number of fire engines at a fire and the amount of damage. Does this mean that the fire engines or the fire department causes the damage? No. It's a spurious relationship. The underlying cause is the size of the fire. So the size of the fire will result in more fire engines, but also in far more extensive damage. Non-spuriousness here uh, can, can be controlled by the random assignment of group. But think about this. Does attending a study group help students make A's? In my experience, when I have held extra study groups, it's the A students who attend. So the study group has very little to do with the outcome of the perpetuation of the A grade since the non-A students typically don't attend. Collecting data from student volunteers, I hope you can see the problem and that students who volunteer are far more likely to be more highly motivated and more likely to be engaged in a subject matter. Other ways of establishing causal relationships would be uh, to look at the causal mechanism or intervening variables. And you'll be dealing with this a great deal in uh, SOS 302 to look at contextual effects to look at or examine cross-tabulations and elaboration, that is, looking at uh, two variable tables and then introducing a third variable to examine the causal nexus, or multiple regression and other regression-based statistical tools, such as path analysis. Again, in SOS 301, or Introduction to Research Methods, we will really be dealing up to 
descriptive data uh, analysis. And in your later courses, you will expand your skill set to incorporate uh, more expansive cross tabulations with three variable tables and elaboration, the multiple regression or other regression based statistical tools. For the nonce, it's good to memorize the terms. It's good to spend some time now uh, ensuring that you have a solid foundation, a foundation that you can use both in the program and one which will be extremely valuable as you embark on your professional career.